know you're doing something right when you're singing Wailing Jennings as an offertory, right? <laughs> that is so good. Praise God. We thank you for being a part of our service today. We thank you for worshiping with us. We have friends in Vermont. Thank you for being a part of our service. We pray the Holy Spirit is with you, even as we sense that presence, as you just heard the presence right there from our worship band. We're on our ninth week, our ninth week, if you're counting, of our series called The Quest, and we're looking at the questions of Jesus. Jesus asks 307 questions in his ministry. He basically, uh, his whole ministry is questions, and he is asked questions. It's a very Jewish formulation. A Jewish uh, cultural thing is to ask and answer a question with a question. And anytime a God is asking us a question, it's not for God's information. It's for our growth. So anytime you see a question in the Bible, see it as a question for you, for what God wants to do. Before we get into our question for the morning, though, I can't wait to tell you about our preacher, our teacher next week. Next week, one of the great academic biblical scholars in the world is preaching. His name is Patrick Hunt. You may know him as the teacher here for over 20 years. He has written 25 books, Creation Groans, one of my favorites, Hannibal. This was a best-selling book on Amazon. He has taught at places that I've never heard of, like Harvard, Yale, Oxford, the Sorbonne, and he will be here to teach next week, so do not miss that. So two weeks ago, we began, or we had a message about how to diffuse conflict. All of us have conflicts, and we saw that one of the best ways is to learn from Jesus to ask questions. And we looked at the Good Samaritan, and it's such a rich story, but we don't realize that Jesus is trying to diffuse a conflict. And anytime anyone comes to you with anger or vituperation of any kind, you can diffuse that by asking, affirming, depersonalizing, it's never about you, and then finally, honoring that person. And last week was Father's Day, and we talked about how men in particular have a tendency to live in extremes. All people do. We work too hard, we consume too much, uh, we play too hard, but the centering thing of our life, the thing that will help us for, from our extreme natures is personal primary relationships. We saw Peter had that with Jesus. So today I want to talk about something we don't think about God much, we don't think about, and that is that God is a God of listening. He is a listening God. If you were to describe the qualities of Jesus, uh, you might say, well, he's a great teacher, a great preacher, an ethicist, a scholar, a prophet. But one of God's best qualities connected to asking questions is listening. So let's talk about the nature of that listening God. God, we come to you today as a world who doesn't feel listened to. We come to you as people who, who live our lives feeling sometimes misunderstood, but generally not listened to. We come to you as, as beings who need someone to hear us and to understand us, to understand not just our words, but our hearts. So be with me today. Help us with this simple lesson that you are a great listener and you listen into the hearts of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of my favorite political pundits, commentators, died two weeks ago. Ever since I was 12 years old, I have followed Mark Shields. Now, if you're not a political junkie like me, you may not have heard of him, but but for 30 years, he was on the PBS NewsHour on Friday nights. Mark was funny. He was thoughtful. He was always kind. He was a Democrat, but he would always speak against or write up against a Republican like William Sapphire or David Gergen or uh, David Brooks. And I always came away feeling better just being around that conversation. Again, I was 12 years old. I didn't understand half of the words Mark Shields was throwing, but I just loved hearing those conversations, and today, it is still one of my favorite things to do. If you ever see me at coffee hour or so, you often find me not engaging in conversation because I love listening to people's conversation. But it isn't just me. Um, how many people listen to podcasts? Anybody here? 
I'm a podcast junkie. How many, how many people watch uh, talk shows? Anybody? Late Night, Stephen Colbert, nobody? Okay. Uh, Jimmy Fallon. The monologues <clears throat> are generally not that good. They're not that funny, but it is the conversations with guests that keeps us awake way later than we should. We all love conversations. I have an uncle that I haven't told you about. My mother's brother is a playwright. He's passed away now, but he was a British playwright, Ranald Graham, and he wrote the play Sweeney. Perhaps you've heard of that play. He also wrote the uh, screenplay for Dempsey and Makepeace. But he always said that the hardest and the most important part of writing is not like setting, it's not like uh, the plot, it's dialogue. If you can get dialogue right, you will draw people in. But if dialogue is not, nobody will watch the show. So we all love conversation. But here's the thing you may not have thought about. God loves listening to conversations. Let me ask you, what happened on the eighth day of creation? We know that first six days, right? God is active. God is separating light from dark, land from water creating animals, birds. The sixth day, God creates us. Seventh day, God rests. What does God do on the eighth day? Well, the eighth day is the fall. It's a conversation. God listens on the eighth day. Remember that conversation? We sometimes, again, focus on the fall, but this is between the snake and, and, and Eve, and the snake says, did God really say that you can't eat of the tree in the middle of the garden? And she said, kind of. God listened. Interesting, God did not enter the conversation. He didn't say, uh, Eve, just stay away from snakes. I mean, they're just no good. He, in a way, honors Eve's independence, her, her autonomy, by staying out of the conversation and listening. And throughout Jesus' ministry, he is listening. Uh, Jesus walks a thousand miles in his three-year ministry with the disciples. It's a long way. And on these walks, the disciples are always in conversation. And the conversation are usually, who's going to be the best? Who's going to be the worst? Who's first in heaven? And very often in the scriptures, you see Jesus standing on the side and simply listening to those chats. One of Jesus' coins of phrase, one of the things he says all the time is, he who has ears, let him so one of his greatest lessons to us is to listen. Jesus loves listening, and he wants us to listen as well. Now, our text is the longest conversation Jesus ever listens to. So I want to share it with you. I've tried to preach this text like five times. I haven't gotten it right yet. I'm not sure I got it right today. But I want us to listen to this conversation between two disciples, not the twelve, who are on their way after Jesus has resurrected and come back from the dead. Again, we're looking at the end of Luke, Luke 24. But I want us to think about this for a moment. Now, Jesus has just vanquished all the forces of evil. Jesus has come back from the dead. He has come back from hell itself. If there was ever a time for Jesus to give a big sermon, it would be now. But no, what has Jesus come back to do? To listen to these two disciples on a road. Let's, let's listen for God's word. We're looking at Luke 24. It's the end of the chapter of Luke. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. Scholars still do not know where Emmaus is. Biblical archaeologists have different theories. Ask Patrick Hunt next week. I have no idea where Emmaus is. Now, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. You get the feeling that these disciples were, were talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. It was a long conversation. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Now again, scholars are divided. Why didn't Jesus just say, hey, it's Jesus? Why did he hide his identity from them? We don't know, but I just like to think that Jesus wanted to hear their conversation that much. So he listens. So he asks them, 
What are you two discussing as you walk along? Again, God knows everything. Why would God ask a question? He's listening. And they stood still, and their faces are downcast. They're, they're quite sad that Jesus has died. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? In other words, what's wrong with you? Everyone knows. It'd be like you going into a store this afternoon and saying, Can you explain what's with the masks? Did something happen in the world? Everybody knows. But then Jesus wants to hear this conversation more, and so he says, what things? And that's when the great conversation begins about Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they, were, they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And, and what's more, it's the third day since all of this took place, Sunday morning. In addition, he says, some of the women amazed us. This is, by the way, how you know this is a real dialogue. If it was just made up for the Bible, it would have said, Mary Magdalene and Salome were there. Some of the women amazed us. But they didn't find his body. They went to the tomb this morning. One of the things I love about this is these are non-biblical scholars talking about God which is another thing God loves. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But God is relying on people like you to talk about God. He would rather people like you talk about God than people like me. And so they're talking about God. Then some, he says, some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. Again, this is how you know it's a real conversation because it doesn't say, yeah, Peter and James and John. But they did not see Jesus. This is beautiful irony. Jesus is standing right in front of them, and they're talking about not being able to see Jesus. Then the text says they had more and more conversation, and then they approached the village to which they were going, and Jesus continued on as if he was going further, which I love, this double entendre. He is. He's going a lot further to heaven. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. If you like classic worship, you may know this, this line goes like this in the Old English. Abide with us. Fast falls the evening tide. That's where the line for that old hymn comes. Stay with us. Interestingly, Jesus would not have stayed with them if they had not asked. So he stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And instantly, their eyes are opened. And they asked each other, after he disappeared from their sight, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Now again, it's a mysterious text, but I just love that their eyes are opened after being heard. A lot of scholars say, well, the, the reason that their eyes were opened is because they had communion. Possible. But I think when people are deeply heard in their lives, when they're really listened to, there is an opening of their eyes. And we'll talk about that in a moment too. But let me just ask you, um, how often do you feel listened to? How often do you really feel that the person or the people that you're talking to really get who and what you are and what you're trying to say. And I think that's the big profound idea for the moment, and that is that we, we worship a, a listening God. Many of you know that um, I finished my doctoral dissertation about five years ago, but you may not know I, I wrote it on Buddhism and Christianity. And what I was interested in is why are not more people Christians today? Why are people going to New Age religions like Buddhism and one of the things I found is that, that Christianity has words tied to it like this. Holy Bible, baptism, denomination, convert, evangelism, repentance, evangelist. They're sort of aggressive words. But Buddhism and New Age theology has words like peace, tranquility, enlightenment, experience, transcendence, listening. Why are Christians not embracing the listening nature of our God? What if... The next time somebody said to you, why do you go to church? 
why do you believe in God? And you would say, I, I just feel that God listens to me more than anybody ever has. Fred Beekner captures this beautifully in his description of the difference between Buddhism and Christianity. He says, Buddha is in the garden sitting on a lotus leaf, pushing the world out and pulling the world in. But Jesus, he said, is on his knees in the garden, listening to all the pains of the world. So we worship a listening God. If that's the case, if God was listening to this world right now, what would God hear? What would God hear in the House of Congress? What conversations would he hear outside the Supreme Court? What would he hear if he was in our coffee hour today? What is it that God would hear in your emails, in your texts, if God was listening? Well, one thing I do know is that it probably would not be conversations about God. They did a study recently, and they asked people, what are the eight things that people talk about most? The first thing that people talk about most is themselves. We love talking about ourselves. We're experts. The second thing people love to talk about is the weather, which I don't really get here in San Francisco because it's pretty much either windy or sunny. If you're in Minnesota, you have something to talk about. We talk about ourselves. We talk about the weather. We talk about current events. We talk about the stuff we hate. We talk about sports, right? You could talk to anybody in the Bay Area about the Warriors or the Giants, except now the Warriors have won. We have nothing to talk about. We talk about our kids, pets. We talk about food. We talk about other people. Those are the eight things we talk about again and again and again. But I noticed, you know, God is not on that list. Do we ever talk about God? Now, I wonder if Jesus went up to these two disciples who are on the way to Emmaus and said, hey, what are you talking about? And one of them said, oh, the weather, it's terrible. It's been 110 here in Judah for the last three weeks. Or what if he said, what are you guys talking about? And one of them said, oh, we had the most amazing ink squid pasta last night and gnocchi, well, oh, it's delicious. What if he asked them what they were talking about? I said, we got these new great sandals. They have a little toe clip, they just fit perfectly, arch support. What if he asked them what they were talking about and, and they said, well, we talk about how much we hate Herod. He is evil and we hate Pilate, we hate the Romans, seven miles of that. But no, he asked them what they're talking about and one of them said, we're talking about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet powerful in word and deed. Do you have anybody in your life who talks about God naturally? I see Loopy here. She's our assistant, executive assistant. She talks about God all the time. We need to model talking about God more as Christians. It's funny. I asked the last congregation to go out to the coffee hour and talk about God. Did you hear any conversations about God? Me neither. We talked about the weather, food, I have two people in my life who naturally and beautifully talk about God all the time. First is a guy named Roy Jeter, who is a member of the church in Paso Robles, and he's the African-American guy in the middle of the picture. He texts me every morning a text about God, totally naturally. Here's the one he sent recently. Peace and love to you and your beautiful family. The Lord is with you always. God bless you. You, no better brother than thee. Keep on making the world a better place and sp spreading God's hope to the world throughout the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. The other guy who talks about God all the time in a natural way is my friend Roosevelt at the gym, prime time. Roosevelt asked me, Pastor, what's the good news? And I said, I don't know. It's been a really hot day. That's not the good news, he said. God is good all the time. It's natural with him. If God was listening to your conversations this week, what would God hear? The last thing I think to think about is, is the part about communion. You know, we say the word communion, but what does that really mean? It means coming together. That's a conversation. And when Cynthia invites you to this table next week, there's a lot of reasons to come. 
But maybe one we've never thought about is coming to the table to be heard for the first time. Coming to this table, all you who don't feel understood or listened to. And when we do, when we do come to this table in that way, our eyes are opened. That's God's promise to us. And we can model that for this world. You know how many people live their lives never feeling heard? You can be Jesus to someone this week. He who has ears, let him hear. Thank you so much, God, for this day, for this moment. Thank you that you are hearing us, even if we are not using words to talk to you today. We ask that we would feel comfortable to pour our hearts out to you. In Jesus' name.